All right. I believe we are live. Tap into the, type in the chat box down there. Let me know if you can hear me, see me. This is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. And today I am joined by Martin Spapellis of Sonarworks. And I believe you're joining us today from Latvia. Is that right, Martin? That's perfectly correct. All right. Good to have you here. Good to be here. Yeah. So the reason we have Martins here is uh, they are one of the sponsors on MixCon, helping make the whole event free to the public. And they have some exciting new software out there. They actually just sponsored a free MixCon masterclass from an amazing producer engineer named Richard Furch. And uh, Richard did a phenomenal masterclass. He's a multi-diamond selling, multi-platinum selling as well. Uh, mixing engineer. He's worked with the likes of, let's see, Jay-Z, Prince, Frank Ocean. Uh, the list just goes on and on. A lot of pop and R&B artists. And he took us under the hood of his approach. And man, he had some amazing insights into mixing, particularly some of the comments he had around mixing bass, which he actually saves for last in the mix, was just mind-blowing to me and a lot of other people. You got to check it out. The uh, link to his full presentation and his Q&A is in the description down there. Also in the description down there, you find a link to Sonarworks, so you can find out more about their latest iteration of Sound ID Reference, which we're going to talk a little bit more about. And you'll find a link to the MixCon Mega Giveaway. We're giving away more than $10,000 worth of free gear, including some great stuff from Sonarworks. So uh, check that out in the uh, comments, and I think we'll uh, we have in the description there as well. Uh, hello to the, those of you joining us. I see uh, Darko from Slovenia uh, in there in the chat. Good to have you back. Uh, Skeleton Pete, good to have you uh, joining us again. Uh, type in, you know, where you're joining us from and what your name is. It looks like we've got a couple dozen of you on here already. And uh, usually we get even more of you as things go, go along. Uh, Steady Technic, good to have you here live from Brooklyn. Sending love to everyone right back at you. All right. I want to give you a quick synopsis of some work stuff, and then we will start talking to uh, Martins and asking him some specific questions. But just in case you're not familiar with Sonarworks and Sound ID Reference, they basically make solutions for correcting and improving the sound of your speakers, your room, and your headphones. So you can really trust what you're hearing and mix with much greater confidence. And this is especially essential for people who are mixing on headphones, want to flatten out the response, really trust what they're hearing, or people in untreated rooms or who have you know less than great speakers, Sonarworks can really notch that stuff up in a cost-effective way. But even if you're in a really nice studio, like Richard Furch, he uses it in his studio, it can be amazing because even when you have good speakers or great speakers and some acoustic treatment going on, you can almost always improve it further with the kind of EQ correction that uh, Sonarworks offers. Now, the really exciting and interesting thing that I want to start asking Martin's about is the latest version of Sound ID Reference because right now they now have multi channel support, including support all the way up to At Atmos 9.1.6. I want to ask him why those formats are interesting, why we should be interested in them, what were some of the obstacles uh, in you know creating this solution for that, and if you want to get into surround sound, how you can best go about it in your studio. But of course, we're not just going to talk about surround and Atmos today. We can talk about stereo. So if you have any questions for Martin's or me about setting up your room for better listening, choosing the best headphones, choosing the best speakers, getting the most out of your listening environment, or just mixing ideas in general, you know, feel free to uh, type them into the comments down below, and we will take them in the order they came in. Uh, before I get to my first question for uh, Martin's, uh, hello to a few more of you. Ant-Man Felix, good to have you. Glad you could make it. Eric Iverson joining us again. Good to have you here, Eric. You asked some great questions last time. Feel free to ask some questions again today. Charlie P joining us from Chicago. Uh, great to have you here. And oh, Ant-Man joining us from Lodi. Very nice in uh, California. And Joanza, thanks for joining us from London, UK. And uh, Eric's with us from Monterey, California. So feel free to type where you are and who you are uh, into the chat there. So Martins, first question for you. Uh, Sonar works now for the first time. Sound ID reference has multi-channel support. Um, first of all, before we even talk about the challenges in getting there, why should we as producers, engineers, and listeners of music be interested in surround sound, multi-channel audio, and specifically in Atmos? Why is it interesting to you? Well, I believe it's uh, very much depends on what exact type of work do you focus on in your career, but I believe kind of 
if you talk like 5.1, 7.1, those formats have been with us for a while now, right? And I believe their main application is still in movie, TV, and broadcast. So if you're working towards that kind of uh, end of the audio value chain, then uh, you probably know already why you're doing it. But if you're just working with music in general, then I think there are two very good reasons. One is it seems that Dolby Atmos is really trending now over the last uh, year or two now when uh, there is like full support on uh, on Apple and uh, also Amazon Music kind of for those formats. And there seems to be a lot of uh, effort going into getting these formats to be popular and the big tech giants are really kind of uh, putting it into existence. Then I think it's a really good time to get on the get on the train and uh, really kind of join this kind of uh, movement from stereo to spatial audio. And the other big reason is, mm, I think more and more of the, there is more and more VR and AR kind of happening around us, right? And mm. I think that's still, there is still a huge future in front of us for those technologies. And also if the audio that you're working on, you want to future proof it for those uh, platforms, then definitely spatial audio is the must have format for audio that goes into VR and AR environments. So kind of if you're working in audio and you want to make it future proof, then also getting in spatial and I guess Dolby Atmos in particular is very smart thing to think about. So that's very interesting. You know, I guess I didn't 100% make the connection in my own head that one of the reasons I've been hearing so much buzz about Atmos, I really feel like for the past year or so, I've just been hearing about it more than ever before. And I was kind of wondering, oh, where is that coming from? And now that you say it, it's so obvious. It is that both Apple Music and Amazon have embraced these. And they have some interesting features. I know at least in Apple Music, they're seamless. You can switch back and forth between an Atmos and a traditional stereo version. Now the Atmos stuff is binaural. But the connection that you're making about Atmos not only being about multi-channel setups, but also being around these augmented reality experiences and virtual reality experiences that companies like Facebook and Meta are kind of, uh, well, I guess it's the same company, uh, that they are kind of getting into is you know, it is such a big thing that they're really pushing forward that they'd be interested in it, not only for the multi-channel setups, but for the personal listening for yeah. the VR. So can you tell us a little bit too about, um, first of all, just the translation between an Atmos mix for a multi-channel format and an Atmos binaural mix? How does one go about creating both of these versions, making sure they both sound good? So first of all, um, I'm a believer that the spatial audio mixes should be created on speakers first. Like as much as I've talked to folks in the industry, then kind of everybody who really knows what they're doing is saying that you should get your Atmos mix, Atmos mix kind of sound great on speakers first and then check how it translates into headphones. Once you get really, really good at it, you can start maybe thinking about headphones first, but there are a lot of a lot more obstacles to kind of mixing first on headphones. Uh, and then kind of checking the translation on speakers. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend it at this point. So first of all, then you really need to have a proper sounding uh, Atmos speaker setup. And then you should make sure that whatever you're creating in audio kind of sounds great on the speakers. And then you can, as a second step, start thinking about how it translates into uh, how it translates into headphones. And there, uh, obviously, the question is, how do you check your mix on headphones? And you have multiple options there. There is the Dolby Atmos uh, binaural renderer. And then if you think your content is going to be listened to on Apple, it's worth checking on how it actually sounds on Apple ecosystem because Apple binaural renderer is not the same as the Dolby one. So there might be some differences there, although I know they're trying to kind of get those uh, get those aligned. So um, yeah, I, I mean, so to make a short answer i believe first make a great sounding mix on your speakers and then check the he check the translation onto headphones via the dolby renderer and check the translation to headphones via the apple spatial kind of uh, audio um, layer i guess and uh, kind of see if those sounds good that makes a lot of sense and it especially makes sense that um you know making panning choices for surround sound on speakers could probably translate better to headphones than making 
uh, surround sound panning choices and headphones and expecting it to translate well to speakers. So that uh, intuitively makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, shout out to a couple more people joining us. Uh, Dan Smith, Montreal, uh, California. Good to have you. Tony joining us from Denver, Colorado. Leon from Minneapolis. Um, Charlie, I see you just uh, uh, entered a question here. We'll get to that question shortly. Uh, any questions uh, that you guys want to ask, just enter them into the chat down below, and I'll be switching to your questions next. I just wanted to get uh, a couple more of my own questions at uh, Martin's just to kind of set the stage for it. And then, Charlie, we'll start with you. And then anyone else who wants to enter questions in, please do, uh, because we'll hopefully we'll get to all of them in, in the order that they came in. So next big question for you here, Martin's, is, you, your company is renowned for working with like super high-end studios and super entry-level studios. Mm -hmm. And we all kind of have a sense for what are the speakers out there if we're just going to get stereo set of monitors. But what do you, would you recommend to someone who just wants to get started in Atmos with a speaker system, but they don't necessarily want to spend tens upon tens of thousands of dollars? I know that one of the super tricky things right now is the hardware. There's a few hardware devices out there that will handle Atmos kind of natively that are going to cost probably a few thousand dollars, at least the ones I'm familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, but what would be your uh, suggestions or, and feel free to throw brands out there. I know you're not going to play favorites with any brands, but just because there's so such a limited number of options out there, what would you recommend to people on both the interface front? And are there any speakers that people have ha been having good results with? Um, do they have to get speakers that are as nice as their main stereo speakers? What are the ideas uh, around both that? Uh, the speakers you could look at in the more entry level and the interfaces as well. All right. Well, uh, those are definitely the two main kind of pieces of hardware that you have to think about when you uh, when you upgrade your studio to an Atmos uh, to an Atmos uh, setup. So first about the interfaces. Well, on one hand, I guess, well, first of all, you have to decide how many channels you want to put up, right? And I believe the kind of minimum spec is 714 if you want to go for an Atmos. And then the uh, maximum Atmos music is 916, but then some people kind of do even more speakers. So uh, I guess you have to start with a, with a choice of how, much, how many speakers do you want. Now, for the interfaces, I get like any interface in my understanding that has enough channels to handle like a single channel for each speaker that you want to have will do. And the only interface at the moment that I think is worth kind of uh, mentioning and kind of picking out from the crowd, I believe is the uh, Avid Matrix interface. Mm -hmm. And the main reason why it's worth a mention separately, I believe is it because actually it has a, uh, a very powerful, uh, powerful kind of DSP in it, which allows you to calibrate your system and dial in the calibration parameters into the interface. So they have 16 parametric EQ points per channel that you can set up. And you can also set the delays for the channel. So basically you can have all your speaker system calibration dialed into the interface, which I think is very convenient. For the, for the setup, because with the Atmos setup, it gets more tricky than with just a stereo setup. You, uh, it's quite hard, uh, quite hard to actually set up the multi-channel system calibration as a plugin. Well, Richard, whom you chatted to, has actually managed to do it, and there are ways how to do it in a software environment, but it's generally way more convenient to do it in a hardware environment because mm -hmm. like you have the DAW and then you have the Atmos renderer and only then comes the hardware. So you have to insert the calibration after the renderer when your sound actually is split up into the channels. And I think uh, the matrix handles that uh, beautifully, although it's not the most uh, budget friendly interface, I believe in the yes. market. Probably. I think there's another one that has entered the fray there. It's one of the new Antelope Galaxy ones, but again, it's priced similarly to the matrix. And I think it has similar functionality, um, yeah. but so, so that I understand better with the new SonarWorks solution, are we going to be able to get that kind of functionality out of basically any interface that has enough audio outputs to run Atmos? And is that the solution that you guys are looking to provide? Uh, if you think about like implementing SonarWorks into your Atmos system, then uh, basically I think interfaces that have the calibration 
facility in them will be kind of a very good option for actually inserting SonarWorks into the chain. We have, uh, and there are kind of like, it, you probably know we have an integration with Anubis uh, interface. Uh, currently it's in stereo, but pretty soon we expect that to be expanded into multi-channel capability as well. So that will be an option. And then uh, we're working also to make the integration with the Avid Matrix interface kind of smoother and uh, more friendly for the user. And then uh, we're also kind of very soon, you will be able to upload our calibration also into an Atom speaker. So kind yes. of that's also, that's, that, that is also kind of finally coming out and... Uh, you might be able to see over my shoulder, I have the new atoms here. And one of the main interesting things about them is they now have this push button where you can select three different modes, um, three different voicings. One of the voicings is their flat voicing. One is their kind of classic, I think they call it UNR voicing. And then one of them, you hit the external button and it basically loads the Sonarworks speaker calibration uh, right into the speaker itself. So beautiful thing for people who've complained about, especially about switching between speakers with Sonarworks. Um, you know, now the it's offloaded to the speaker itself, just with an Ethernet cable that goes from your computer to the speakers. So beautiful that you're able to have the uh, the Sonarworks calibration running directly in the speaker. I think that's a totally awesome development and excited to see these guys doing it. And hopefully, I don't know if uh, you're exclusive with them or if more might follow suit, but uh, it just seems like an awesome feature from a line of speakers I already love. So uh, yep. another MixCon presentation that's coming up soon. Uh, check that out. There are sponsors on MixCon as well. If you want to enter the MixCon mega giveaway, they're also giving away a set of speakers. So uh, definitely check that out. Mm -hmm. Now, last question for me before we jump to some of these great questions that have come in from Charlie here, from Eric here, and any of you who want to ask questions, please uh, type them right into the chat. Um, so last question for me is, so can you give me just the short version of what is new in the latest iteration of sound ID reference. What can people do with it that they couldn't do before? So the latest feature, as you already uh, mentioned in the introduction, is that we have expanded the calibration functionality to handle multi-channel systems up to 916 speakers. And if you just think about it, then for multi-channel speaker environments, the calibration is actually even more important than it is for a stereo thing, because if you think about working in Dolby Atmos and you have these objects that you can pan around in three-dimensional space around you. Now, even if you are lucky and you have the same speakers kind of for all your channels, which is rarely the case, very often people actually have different speakers on different channels. And then even if you have the same speakers on every channel, and then the same kind of model of a speaker on, the, on every channel, then your room will still be somewhat asymmetric and kind of mm -hmm. uh, that will affect the frequency response. So if the frequency response of your speakers is different, then it means that as you move the object around you in the space, its sound will change just based on kind of subjectively for you, just based on where you place that sound in, in that 3D space which is not good for the quality of the mix, right? And also if you have this single audio object, which is rendered by several of the speakers, and if the delays of the speakers are not perfect, like if they're not spaced kind of perfectly at the same distance from your head in your room, which again is rarely the case. And if you haven't adjusted the delays correctly, then that image will just kind of wash out and you will not hear it as sharp as you should. And uh, also the kind of, uh, phase alignments between the like phase alignments between the channels and between the satellite channels and the subwoofer uh, are especially important kind of in the in the atmos and in the multi-channel environment and our latest kind of uh, version of sound id reference actually takes care of all of these things we have the user-friendly interface that guides you through the measurement of the system now scaled to handle multi-channel uh, systems. And it takes care of the frequency response of the channels. It takes care of the time delays between the channels and it takes care of the phase alignment between the channels uh, so that you can actually arrive at the best possible sound from your speakers in your room. And it really kind of, uh, yeah, as much as like every time I've heard it, it really kind of uh, improves the sound of the system uh, considerably. And uh, you can calibrate your system towards either a flat response, or if you're working in Dolby Atmos, then Dolby has this uh, Dolby Atmos music curve that they recommend as the reference sound for mm -hmm. the studio where you produce. So you can also choose that 
as the as the reference sound and we cross checked it with uh, a umg guys at the capital studios and they said that yes this is exactly the sound that they like and, uh, so that i understand it better why does dolby atmos have a non-flat reference curve this is a curve not for playback but for monitoring on to my understanding and what is the uh, purpose behind that curve that they recommend when you're mixing in atmos the right approach would be asking this uh, to the dolby people themselves so i can only kind of um, summarize the stories about this that i've been hearing but what i what i understand the intent of dolby was was that they actually want to create mixes that sound as good as possible on the Atmos consumer devices that the kind of people who want to experience the spatial audio will listen to. And through some research and experimentation, they have found that this Dolby Atmos target curve is what makes records that translate as good as possible to the consumer Atmos devices. But so, as I under yeah, so that's kind of uh, that's how I understand it. But yeah, at the end of the day, then Dolby kind of expects that you mix these on the uh, on the Atmos music curve and the consumer devices where Dolby decoder is present are built with the assumption that the content has been created on the Atmos music curve. So interesting. So there is a curve that you'd be monitoring through when you're making your choices. To my understanding, it's kind of a darkening curve. So you'd be yes. brightening things up a little bit more, but then at the other end, is the Dolby decoder darkening it back down or is it kind of playing through flat and they're just encouraging you to mix brighter because they think that'll work better on the average consumer systems out there? I've heard both versions as the answer, so I wouldn't <laughs> be able to give you the official yeah. answer. <laughs> All right. This is something we have to explore more. All right. Let's get into questions from you guys. I think I've uh, monopolized Martin's long enough because we have some great questions here from Charlie, Eric, and now Dan. Um, there's even more of you joining us uh, now than when we first started. So uh, if you're new here, uh, we are asking questions live of Martin's of Sonarworks. Uh, feel free to ask us anything you want about monitoring, about headphones, about speakers, about room correction, about uh, speaker EQ, about surround sound and Atmos or stereo. And uh, let's get right into it. So Charlie P says, I reached out to Sonarworks in the past about a hardware solution, employing a monitoring controller with sources, including analog. I need to adjust the output side for speakers and headphones. Any updates on that? an analog solution or switching a hardware solution from Sonarworks potentially someday. Yes. So as you probably have noticed over the last couple of years, we have been really working to expand our number of collaborations with different hardware manufacturers on the mm -hmm. interface side and on the speaker side. So currently, as we speak, we have an integration with Wayne Jones speakers and we have an integration with merging Anubis interfaces and uh, very soon, we will be launching integration with Adam Audio Speakers, expanding the Anubis onto multi-channel, and there are some more partnerships that are kind of coming up. So we have been, we really kind of, I mean, I generally subscribe to that point of view that that would be a great solution, and we're working towards that. Uh, over the last years, I mean, as probably everybody knows, but generally the hardware manufacturing uh, world has been in a very nightmarish mode kind of keeping up with all the kind of challenges brought on by the covid and the ukraine war and everything so plenty of demand hard. but hard to make enough hardware yeah, yeah it really has been a struggle all across the hardware industry so some of the partnerships that we have been working on have really not been uh, launching on the market as quickly as we hoped they would because of the different struggles in the hardware world so there is definitely more things uh coming up and uh, in general kind of we're uh, yeah we're trying to do the best we can there but so generally i think yes i really well, like that great. direction and we'll be working towards that more that's great to hear that those things are coming and it's not from you guys dragging your feet that they haven't come to realize uh, fruition yet and it definitely makes sense with the uh, i mean there's uh, hardware companies that couldn't make chips for a long time i remember uh, universal audio uh, reaching out to us uh, saying hey you know we are have more demand for interfaces than ever, but we just can't make enough of them because we can't get the things that we need to actually make the hardware. And I knew they weren't alone. Um, so uh, hopefully those uh, types of things start to heal themselves uh, before too long. And uh, I love, 
I love the direction you guys are going with more integration. You can see it physically in the speakers right over my shoulder here. Uh, these Atom speakers do have that Sonarworks integration already happening. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing more and of these just, just to be clear, they have the capability, but for it to be enabled, there needs to be a software update both yes. on Adam's side and our side. And that I believe will happen over the next couple of weeks. But Right. Yeah. And that is going to require if you get these speakers early, you just plugging your computer in uh, Ethernet and for firmware update or whatever on the, the monitors. But yes, it's, it's, it's ready to go within them. Uh, and once you guys have the software updated, it will be uh, actually occurring. All right. Uh, so next here, Eric Iverson. By the way, I don't think almost I don't think any consumers have these yet. I think um, they haven't even hit the stores yet, to my knowledge. I know Sweetwater I think is doing pre-orders on them still, maybe. But um, all right. Next question, Eric Iverson. I wish there was a way to map out my room, a spare bedroom, and based on my specific frequency responses, have Sound ID spit out a suggested acoustic treatment plan. Any plans for something like that? I think that is really creative. I don't know if you guys have uh, thought of that yet, but that's an interesting idea. Um, any thoughts on that one, Martins? I have been uh, thinking about this exact idea for uh, quite some time now, mm -hmm. and uh, it's definitely in our kind of roadmap. So uh, yeah. I wouldn't uh, want to give any kind of specific dates yet because that's quite a, quite a big feature to kind of build and launch, but I would yeah. definitely want to go there and I think it's a cool idea. Awesome. So uh, great minds think alike there, Eric. I thought that was a really interesting one and apparently it's uh, the idea is not lost on Martin's either. So great to hear. Um, Dan Smith says, greetings. Is there an upgrade or cross-grade path from Reference 4 Studio Edition to the next multi-channel edition? Cheers, Dan. I have to look at our uh, SKU table, but uh, I believe if you uh, if you would just uh, reach out to our support team at uh, support at sonarworks.com, then uh, they would do their best to answer you promptly to that question. So I want to say there is, but I also don't want to now kind of uh, say for 100% because yeah. it's like, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I do see a page here on Sonarworks. It's sonarworks.com slash sound ID dash reference slash upgrade info. And they do seem to have some info here about upgrading from an older reference version, upgrading your reference for a reference three to sound ID reference. Uh, so I just found that link. Let me try to see if it allows me to put it into the chat. Um, so I just put that in there for you. Let me know if. Uh, that one uh, is at all helpful, but I think it should have some answers in there. Just so I understand, you know, with Sonarworks, it used to be Sonarworks, and then you had Sonarworks 2, and you know, then it became Sonarworks Reference, and then we got Reference 3 and Reference 4, and now it's changed to Sound ID Reference. Are you going to be numbering Sound ID Reference as it gets upgraded, or is it going to be like subscription-based only, so you never update numbers? Exactly how is that kind of thing working? I don't have the exact answer to that yet. I believe we will uh, end with some sort of uh, numbering, but mm -hmm. uh, let's see. It's actually we're now uh, during Q4 we'll be planning kind of the next uh, the next roadmap for uh, for the next year, and that's one of the answers we still need to answer. Mike. Gotcha. So, quick question here: If someone bought Sound ID Reference, you know, yeah. last year, now this multi-channel support is it just available as part of their sound ID reference, or do they have to upgrade to get that if they uh, already have? Multi, multi-channel is a separate edition, so there nice. is an upgrade path from like we have three editions now. We have the headphone edition, we have mm -hmm. the speaker and headphone edition, which works for stereo speakers and headphones, and mm -hmm. then we have the multi-channel edition, which includes the previous two and also enables the multi-channel. So that's a third edition and if you just brought brought bought the regular stereo then you need to upgrade gotcha so there's headphones headphones and speakers and now multi-channel three different versions and you can upgrade from either the headphones version or the headphone and speaker version to the multi-channel version uh if okay. you're ready in sound id reference okay that makes a lot of sense so new product rather than an update to the old product all right. Uh, next question here. Apparently, The Rocker had the same question as Dan Smith. Hopefully, that link that I threw in there is useful for you guys. Uh, hopefully, that'll have some info. Um, Charlie P is excited to hear that there uh, are potential hardware solutions coming, so he'll hold tight and look for that. Dio Asbin says, any timeline on adding more newly released studio headphone presets like the Neumann NDH30? 
What's the typical timeline of adding new headphone presets? Many thanks. It is uh, it is more like uh, which headphones our team selects to be kind of added to the database rather than the time. I mean, once we get our hands on the headphones, we can get the I mean, we can get the profile done fairly quickly, like within a week or two, but it more depends on the overall kind of uh, timeline and roadmap for our team. So uh, I can just uh, make note on the particular headphone that's being asked for, and then I can, uh, yeah, I can kind of uh, check in on the timeline. I wouldn't know of the specific model right top of my head, but sure. uh, yeah, we try to we try to keep an eye on what headphones are coming out and what headphones seem to be interesting for the music creator community and then prioritize them accordingly and expand the database. But so what is the, what's the headphone model? He had said the Neumann NDH30. I'm going to look that up uh, right now on my All end right. here. Um, oh yeah. These are the closed. These are, uh, I'm familiar with, I think the NDH twenties, which are the closed back, which are, Probably the best sounding closed back headphones I've ever heard. They're about five hundred and fifty dollars, and I've just never they they really respond and sound like um, the the kind of frequency response you'd expect more out of open backs. And I think these NDH thirties, which I wasn't actually aware of uh, existing yet, they are an open back version. Uh, I don't know if you guys know when those came out, um, but uh, those are about six hundred fifty dollars set of headphones. And if they're anywhere near as good as the NDH twenties, I'm sure they're uh, wonderful. I was really shocked and surprised by the NDH twenties when I heard them, and I would I would put them uh, among my my favorite um, closed backs I've ever heard. So I, I'd be excited to hear these NDH thirties. Um, there are uh, I know that uh, one of the, the the headphones that you guys at Sonarworks have always recommended as being some of the flattest response in the mid range and high frequencies, especially. Uh, have been the Sennheisers, I believe the HD 300s, and they're a great affordable yeah. one um, for people kind of uh, looking for, not super affordable, I mean, like a few hundred dollars set of headphones. My only qualm with those has been that they don't have the kind of low frequency extension that I'd really like. And although Sonarworks helps with that, um, you run into obstacles with getting useful information below 100. And I feel like those um, NDH headphones from Neumann are a good one. So I would give a second uh, recommendation for that. Now, Katrina from Sonarworks is here in the chat and she has written in, new headphones are added based on your request smiley face. So you just made the request here. If you want to hit them extra, like go to the customer support and send them another email. And then if you have this coming from multiple places, even if you're one guy and you sound like a squeaky wheel, who knows what'll happen? The power if there is a way how I can like <laughs> follow up in the uh, in the question section in the kind of comment section of this YouTube uh, video or some other way, I can definitely find out with the team and uh, follow up in like. Yeah, well, hopefully Katrina, who's apparently listening, uh, Katrina, if you don't mind taking a note on those headphones and see if it's something that the uh, the headphones uh, want to uh, the the team wants to uh, model. Paul Jenkins says, "I love using my HiFi Man HE four hundred S headphones." Cool. I'm not familiar with those. I'll have to look them up. Uh, Paul, do you know if those are modeled yet in uh, Sonarworks? Are you using Sonarworks to help correct them? Dio says, I did send a request. NDH30 are terrific for mixing and mastering. We'd love to have a profile for them added. So, all right. Um, yeah. We're coming up on just a bit. Uh, and Katrina says, well noted. So she's uh, going to bring that to the team. And this is why you joined Sonic Scoop Live Chats. So this is, uh, this is a good, I'm glad that you came. Uh, now, it looks like there's a few dozen of you guys uh, here currently. So if you have any more questions, please type them into the chat below. We've um, talked to Martins now for about a half an hour. And I think he's given us a lot of info. But if you have any last desperate burning questions, uh, please let us know here uh, in the comments. One more question uh, for me uh, to you, Martins. Did you check out um, Richard's, uh, I know it just happened yesterday. I don't know if you're able to watch it, but did you check out his MixCon presentation? If so, any thoughts? Or if not, do you have any thoughts in general on things that you've uh, learned from or appreciated about Richard's approach to mixing in general? Well, I mean, obviously Richard's a great guy and his mixes sound amazing and he has a great studio. So uh, that's that. But uh, Richard is very unique in my experience in the sense that he has really really kind of grown fond of his stereo system first 
And then he knows exactly how mixes that he creates on that system translate to the outside world. And obviously he's doing a lot of good mixes. So that works for him. And then his unique kind of ask and request about his system was that, hey, yes, I know there is this flat curve and I know there is this Dolby Atmos music curve, but can we make so that my, can we do it so that the Atmos, uh, can we do it so that my kind of Atmos setup can also sound the way how I have used to my stereo speakers sounding. And we really kind of with the calibration with and with the kind of custom EQ feature that we have in our plugin, we really kind of uh, delivered that. And I think Richard was uh, very happy about that because now he knows he, he, he has the sound that he knows and he knows how it translates to the outside world and he can also use it to create his Atmos mixes. But Obviously, I mean, I think the lesson that you can make from that is that whatever system you work on, you still have to be aware and you still have to kind of mm, give yourself kind of, uh, how, how to say that, you kind of still have to think and be aware how the music that you create in your studio will translate to the outside world. So kind of, if you've done a lot of mixes, then you already know that. If you're just new to the thing, then you still need to do the mix checking of your of your kind of production. But so you can work on a system that you are very used to, or you can work on a flat system, or you can work on a Dolby Atmos music tune system. You still have to know how that will translate to say Apple music or how that will translate to kind of other Atmos kind of sounding systems out there. And uh, yeah. That is very cool. I love that idea that you added. I think it was an addition with sound ID reference, the idea of you know target curves that would be different than flat. And I thought this was that was one of the first things that I noticed is he said, you know, I already love the the speaker system I'm on. I've learned it. I know it. I don't need to change it, even if it's arguably improving it, because I just know how it translates. But I want everything else to match it. Um, so creating uh, like a mimic of his uh, speaker system with uh, sound ID reference for all the satellite speakers is a great idea. But because also he now doesn't have to spend the same amount of money on all the satellite speakers <laughs> that he did on his mains, uh, yeah. and he can try to match them. Um, so I get that idea. You know, um, I'm going to say one thing. I've uh, these headphones I discovered before I really knew about Sound ID reference um, and uh, knew that it's something I should be using. So I never have used them on these headphones because I already know exactly how they translate. But when I moved into my new room and when I got my new speakers, I ran Sound ID on the speakers. I ran on the room. Um, so I still absolutely use it. But there's the one thing that I already learned before. I discovered sound ID reference that I didn't want to change. So I can, uh, that can, that resonates with me a little bit that uh, sometimes you don't want to rock the boat, even by arguably improving it if you already know it so well. Uh, but that said, I think it's likely that if he ever had to move rooms again, he might be applying uh, sound ID reference to his uh, stereo speakers that he already knows in addition to the surrounds. Mm -hmm. um, and I know he uses them on his headphones as well. So. Um, so we have a couple more questions here. Uh, first of all, I'll read a comment from Katrina from Sonoworks, who's there in the chat. And she says, Dio, you can always send in your headphones for individual calibration, even if there is no average profile offered publicly in the software. That's a, a great thing to add, Katrina. A lot of people, I don't think, even know that Sonoworks does that. But when you get a, a pair of headphones off the shelf and you use the cut the preset for those headphones that's in the software it's an average of the average response of those headphones but any drivers they can vary in frequency response this is particularly probably even more so on headphones than on speakers um, but when you send them in for calibration it's an exact calibration to your exact headphones and while that might be overkill on some $50 or $100 pair of headphones, you do own, Dio, a $650 pair of headphones. <laughs> Maybe that could be something that's useful to do. The only thing that would be annoying is having to be without them for the week or however long it takes. Katrina, can you let us know there in the comments uh, how much it costs to do that and how long the headphones are usually away? Because those would be the only obstacles for people because otherwise it's a, a fantastic idea. So I appreciate you put that in the chat, Katrina. All right, a couple more questions here for you. KM3 music, when upgrading from reference four to reference sound ID reference, do we just need to upgrade to the new software or do we need to upgrade the microphone and software? No, you just, uh, the microphones are backwards compatible. Mm -hmm. So there is no need to upgrade the microphone. 
but uh, you just need to upgrade the software. Sounds great. And if I remember correctly, you guys actually test the microphones themselves and they come with a serial number that you put in. So Sonar works like knows the calibration of the microphone itself too. Is that something you guys are doing? I can't remember. Yes, exactly. So that's one of the unique things about our microphones is that we actually individually calibrate them and we do it ourselves in our lab so we can really sign off on the calibration profiles. Yeah. And actually a cool thing now that uh, with the multi-channel version, we now actually use the uh, we now actually use multi-angle calibration profiles for the measurement microphones because if wow. you think about it, when you put the microphone in your room, then the kind of lower level speakers will be coming in roughly like at the 90 degree angle to the microphone, mm -hmm. and the ceiling speakers will coming be coming in at a different angle, and the angular frequency response of the microphone is not kind of completely flat. right. Even so, though it is an omni microphone, it's still omni isn't perfectly omni. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So uh, we kind of take that into account, and that uh, really, really makes the result very consistently great. Yeah, great to know. Um, and then Katrina is also answering that question uh, as well in there, and uh, she says Sound ID Reference Trial can be installed in parallel with Reference Four, so you can even try it out before upgrading. Oh, very cool to know. Uh, good stuff. So I think we are about uh, 45 minutes uh, or about 40 minutes here into our chat uh, with Martins. Uh, I think we've asked a good number of questions. Uh, if you have any uh, burning, oh, wait a second. One more here that's coming from Darko. He says, is Sound ID stable to try it again? Oh, he's probably talking about the consumer version of Sound ID. Is Sound ID, is, ID stable to try it again? A few years ago, I bought Reference and last year also, or maybe he's talking about Reference, Last year, I also upgraded to Sound ID, but it did not work for me when I installed it. So I still use Reference. I'm guessing he's talking about Reference 4 versus Sound ID Reference. Did you guys have early kinks in the original uh, Sound ID Reference, oh. and if so, have they been worked out? We definitely have been working on. Uh, we definitely have been working on uh, like having our fair share of uh, kinks, and then also with the. Apple M1 upgrade kind of, uh, we didn't have the support for the M1 chipset for a while and now we have it. And uh, we, throughout this year, we have actually been focusing quite a bit on working out the different kind of kinks and bugs and kind of making the software smoother. There are still things that are we are working on. So I wouldn't know now what exactly was the kind of uh, issue for this particular person who's asking the question. But so we have definitely improved the stability of the software quite a bit. Uh, but if you want to know the part, if you had some very particular kind of uh, challenge with the software, I would, uh, I would probably recommend reaching out to our support team and checking if that particular thing has been, uh, has been fixed. So overall, we're really monitoring uh, kind of user feedback across all the channels and kind of where people are complaining, especially kind of about something not working. And that's obviously not where we want to be. I think now we feel we're in a fairly good place. We're kind of 95 plus percent of the users are saying that everything kind of works great and as advertised. So I think it should be fine. And uh, I would welcome the person to kind of try it out again. But uh, if you're really kind of, uh, if there is a really kind of some sensitive issue, then uh, please check in with the support team and probably sure. they'll be able to tell if that issue I would, went away. I would imagine in a case like this, uh, would potentially customer sort be, uh, support be able to reset a trial uh, period for such a oh, person? Most, most definitely, yes. Great. So yeah, definitely reach out to customer support, find out for yourself for whatever it's worth. Uh, on my particular operating system, I've actually never had trouble with Sound ID Reference uh, from the beginning. And I got it from you guys pretty much when it was announced. I know different mm -hmm. people might be different based on the particular um, OS version they're on. I generally have older OSs on my computer because I'm very slow to upgrade things because I don't want things to stop working. So maybe uh, that's the difference between me and you. If uh, you have like the latest OS, I know that I, I, in audio, I've always run into problems whenever I've tried to have the latest OS. So I basically never do. Um, so but I think that wouldn't be something that you would find only in Sonarworks, but basically like literally every single program that you'd expect to use professionally. Um, man, the biggest one for me, I hate to just make this uh, into, you know, is Adobe Premiere. My goodness, when I have to do video editing, the co how this is one of the leading professional software programs in the world, 
I have no idea. It crashes on me constantly. And yet I still use it every day. And I don't know why. I don't want to learn a new software system. So anyway, let that be uh, a lesson to you. Don't don't try to have the latest OS. But Darko says he will try it again. And do, like I said, Darko, reach out to customer support. It's likely that they would reset that trial for you, uh, as uh, Martin said. Um, it's been good for me. And uh, I hope it uh, works for you. Uh, Dio says, thanks for the responses. How long are headphones away if I send them for individual calibration? And is it done inside the US or elsewhere? Lastly, any integration with Dolby Atmos that Sonarworks offers? I think uh, for that last question, Dio might have missed uh, our introduction. We talked quite a bit about Atmos, but um, any answers to those two? If you want to recap what you guys are doing with Dolby Atmos very quickly, because we talked about a bunch in the beginning. And two, if he sends his headphones away, how long does he have to be without them for them to be calibrated? All right. So uh, shall we start with the headphone question? Uh, so uh, first of all, we are calibrating the head, like the individual calibration happens in our lab, which is here in Riga, Latvia, which is in northern part of Europe. So that's outside of US. And then coming to the second part of the question, uh, it really depends on the kind of exact method of shipping that kind of uh, we end up agreeing on. I believe kind of when you uh, when you purchase this individual calibration uh, service, then uh, our team gets in touch and kind of uh, figures out the best way how to organize the uh, how to organize the shipping. But then, besides shipping, I believe the headphone has to be with us for something like a week, roughly. So all in all, I would say the process will take somewhere between two to three weeks if you would want to ship them to us, then let us calibrate and ship them back to you. So that's roughly ballpark kind of uh, what we're talking about. Okay. So two to three weeks without them, uh, unless there is some crazy expedited shipping going on. And do you know uh, roughly the costs off the top of your head for the calibration service? I wouldn't know at top of my head, Katrina, if you're there and if you can kind of maybe post it in the in the chat, then uh, that would be awesome. All right. Uh, a couple more uh, questions here. KC asks, okay, I'm late. What do you answer, mean by- should, should we answer this uh, Dolby Atmos integration question? Oh, or, yes, uh, I'm sorry. Please go yeah, ahead. Yeah. yeah, so the how we integrate with Dolby Atmos is a great question. So for Dolby Atmos, as you know, there is the DAW, then there comes the Dolby Atmos renderer, which is a separate software. And then only after renderer, you actually get the audio split into discrete channels, which then normally go out to your interface and into your speakers. Now, the question is, how do you put Sonarworks calibration into such system? And then there are several options. First, best option in my mind is if you have a hardware unit, either an interface or a speaker that's capable of Sonarworks calibration DSP inside that unit. And notably, Avid Matrix interface is kind of uh, one where you can dial in the Sonarworks calibration parameters and we have an export that's kind of facilitates that and it will improve the kind of, it will be even smoother in the future. Then there is also the uh, Anubis merging technologies Anubis interface, which will handle the multi-channel integrate like the multi-channel calibration very soon. Adam Audio speakers will kind of handle like the latest Adam Audio speakers will handle calibration very soon. And Wayne Jones speakers, which were also integrated with, will also handle the calibration very soon. Now, besides these options, uh, I, yes, as you, Justin, mentioned, also there is the Antelope Ori Orion interface that handles the calibration, although at a smaller resolution than the uh, Avid Matrix. And we don't have a specific integration at this point in time, but you can definitely kind of work something out if you have that interface. And then you also have an option in the Dolby Atmos renderer in some editions, you actually have the calibration option within the renderer software. So we support kind of tuning that system. You can kind of get the parameters that you need to dial in into the system. Uh, and then last but not least, if you're kind of uh, geeky enough, you can find ways how after the renderer, you can actually route the audio back into your DAW as a discrete kind of channels, and then you can put our plugin onto that track 
and then kind of pass it out to the actual interface. So there is also that. It's a little more complicated setup mm -hmm. to kind of work out, but it's possible. Like Richard has done it, and uh, I know a couple of more folks who are running it that way. So it's also possible, although kind of it's uh, yeah a little. It takes a little fiddling around to actually set it up. Right. Very interesting. Great question. Uh, here's a really simple one for you. Ido asks, does Sound ID also work with systems that have a subwoofer? Yes, it does. But then uh, kind of we need to start breaking it down a little. If you're talking about stereo systems, then subwoofer is just a part of the stereo output. So you still have two outputs. And if you use Sound ID reference, then you just measure your system just as a regular stereo system and then you calibrate it as a regular calibrated system and then the software will just kind of pick up the frequency response from the speakers and the subwoofer and also calculate the profile that will fit that system accordingly now if you're talking about multi-channel and atmos system then the subwoofer is normally kind of a separate lfe channel which then sits on a separate channel so our calibration handles that and uh, if you have a base management set up then you can also just kind of you then we recommend that you actually leave it on and measure it with the base base management enabled as you uh, as you have in your system and you can also measure that and the sound ID reference will yeah then capture the frequency response of your system and the other parameters and uh, calibrate it for you very cool great very thorough answer uh Casey asks, uh, I'm late, but what do you mean by fixing your room speakers and headphones? Is this about mixing music or something else? It is about mixing music on better speakers, headphones, and uh, the like by using Sonarworks and uh, uh, correcting the weird frequency response that is almost certainly present in your room speakers and headphones, which I'm sure has been annoying you as much as it annoyed me before I got my monitoring together. Probably one of the it was interesting, Richard Furch in his um, Q&A when I was asking him, you know, a few people asked him about gear and favorite gear and what's the most important gear to buy. He went straight to monitoring. He was like, the two biggest things to invest in are number one, your monitoring, and then number two, yourself, your skills. He's like, you know, gear is important. If you have bad gear, you might not get good sounds. But like, if we're talking about order priority, number one, your room, because your skills themselves are going to be held back by not being able to tr simply trust what you hear and your full skills will not ever like get to show their glory. If you're second guessing yourself or making bad choices because you're getting bad feedback from what you're hearing. So for him, monitoring was number one. Sonar works is huge in helping with that. And then number two is uh, improving your own skills. Once you have good monitoring and then everything else is secondary. And I, I couldn't agree more with that. Um, you're, you, it's going to seem like you get more skilled once you get your monitoring <laughs> together because you're just able to intuitively make the decisions you want to make and have those work everywhere. And then it's easier to develop your skills as well uh, once you get feedback uh, that you can trust. So a uh, big shout out to Sonarworks Sound ID Reference. Uh, I can't recommend it enough, whether you've got low-end speakers and headphones or high-end speakers and headphones. I think they're going to significantly improve what you do. Uh, Katrina just typed in there that they do have that custom calibration service that is it's $149 if uh, you have some high-end headphones that you want you know, tested yourself. But uh, for any of the headphones uh, where the presets are in there, they do a great job. Uh, and uh, for the speakers, you get a measurement microphone that you can measure your room with, and they'll correct all that stuff. Uh, Leon J says, I have a unique secondary monitoring system, the Eames Mini Owl N-Sub. It's a signal, single cabinet with left and right channels and independent amps. It does have stereo separation, but Sound ID sees it as mono. Any suggestions to use Sound ID with this setup? I think that's similar to the way any um, sub runs. Is that right, Martins? Mm, can you repeat the setup of the system? He says it's a single cabinet with okay. left and right channels okay. and independent amps. It does have stereo separation, but Sound ID sees it as mono. Mm. I mean, if the system registers to the computer as a stereo system, then uh, I would expect our software to also see, I mean, at that point, when it connects to the computer, 
the system doesn't know anything else besides here's the left channel and here's the right channel, right? right. So it yeah. should be able to, I mean, if it's a stereo system from a computer's perspective, then you should be able to connect sound ID reference to it as regularly. But where it where it kind of gets tricky, I think, is if you're saying it's a single cabinet system, then mm -hmm. I guess it's kind of like it has several drivers in it where maybe one is left and one is right, but it's a mm -hmm. single cabinet, meaning it's probably also very small, I would expect. And then if the drivers of left and right are close, I don't remember now by heart, but there is something like, if they're closer, like half a meter, and I don't know how much that is in inches, but I mean, it needs to be wider than say a laptop a bit for the uh for the speaker measurement software to be able to run like if the drivers are really really kind of next to each other one way or another then i don't think the measurement process will run uh as it's expected to because it expects some some kind of distance between the left and right drivers mm. does that make sense gotcha interesting yeah no he says he follows up to say the calibrated mic won't recognize the difference between left and right channels yes so if the drivers are too close to each other yeah. Uh, then it wouldn't work. So uh, it kind of expects to have some triangle between like the left, right, and your listening position. Right. So okay. there might be. Uh, yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't think there is an easy solution to that, unfortunately. Gotcha. Understood. Um, last. Uh, and and he says that what you're saying, Leon, uh, Leon says what you're saying is exactly the case that uh, he's dealing with. So you understood his question much better than I did. Um, and uh, last one here, Daywar says I have. IK Multimedia iLoud MTM. Uh -huh. uh, can I use the measurement mic to calibrate them for Atmos once I get three more pairs? Yes. So, uh, is he asking about the uh, is he asking about the IK Multimedia microphone or mic IK Multimedia speakers? Good question. He says I have the IK Multimedia iLoud MTM. My guess is that is a set of speakers that comes with a microphone for the MTM system, which is, it, okay, okay, is okay. that is kind of a competitor to the Sonarwork solution? To some extent, yes. Hmm. Uh, I, think, I think the short answer is yes. Generally, we do not limit users to using only our measurement microphone. So Correct, yeah. basically any measurement microphone will do, including the IK multimedia one. That said, I would recommend kind of trying things out with IK multimedia microphone in this case. And then if you like what you're hearing and if you like kind of what's going on with the Sonarworks software, I would recommend considering buying Sonarworks microphone at some point because of this individual calibration that we have that kind of, I believe is unique. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know too many other microphones in the budget microphone kind of price range that come with this calibration profiles. And also, as I mentioned before, we have these multi-angular, multi-angle calibration profiles that are important if you talk about calibrating an Atmos room where the speakers mm -hmm. are coming at different angles at you. So I would I would suggest kind of trying it out with the IK multimedia microphone. And then if you like it, then consider getting Sonarworks microphone and reshoot the room and you might actually experience an improvement in the sound yeah, because great. of the calibration kind of being compatible with the way our software works. So you can use basically any measurement microphone and it will almost certainly, I wouldn't say almost certainly, it will certainly improve your room compared to where it is because the differences in the frequency response of measurement microphones are almost certainly infinitesimally small compared to the frequency response differences in your room. So pretty much any um, re you know, reference quality measurement microphone is going to work with Sonarworks, but like Martin says, they have a super cool thing where they take their measurement microphones and they measure their measurement microphones. So they know if they're off by the tiniest bit, they can correct for that. And also from different angles, which is absolutely brilliant. Uh, I'm so glad uh, to use that. So uh, Dewar says actually the iLoud MTM uses Sonarworks to calibrate them currently. I didn't know that. So uh, that's, that's what he writes in there. I'm not sure if I understood that. I thought it was his own separate platform, but uh, Martin's looks as confused as I am. So, I mean, you can definitely calibrate IK Multimedia speakers with Sonarworks. That said, 
I'm pretty sure we don't have an integration with them. And I'm pretty yeah. sure they have their own measurement software. Gotcha. Uh, so that's a testament to SonarWorks. If someone out there who's listening right now says, I have these IK Multimedia speakers in there uh, that have their own reference uh, solution, but I'm using SonarWorks with them anyway, that would be a great vote for SonarWorks. <laughs> so uh, good stuff. Well, way to go if you ask me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for joining us. Martins, we've taken up his time for an hour now. He's been so generous uh, with his time and given us great answers. It's amazing how much of the stuff he just knows off the top of his head and how deep he clearly is in all the ideas around room speaker correction, why it's useful. And uh, you can tell this all the stuff is, at the, it seems like it's at the front of your brain all day long. Uh, how, how good you are talking about. thinking about these things yeah well you picked the right line of work martins so uh great to have you guys uh here on the line with us i think we're gonna have to uh call it a day here after this hour chat but if you want to find out more definitely go to sonarworks.com sonarworks.com slash sound id dash reference to find out more about the latest solution I'm going to recommend that you sign up for the MixCon Mega Giveaway, where we are giving away more than $10,000 worth of free gear. So check that out. There is a uh, link here in the description of the video. I'll put one into the comments as well. Um, so you got multiple chances to win. And uh, SonarWorks has given away some stuff there. Adam has given away some speakers. So check those out as well. And also, if you haven't yet, check out the sponsored MixCon Masterclass from Richard Furch. It is tied right now for our most popular MixCon masterclass uh, so far this year. And for good reason, it's a phenomenal one. He has amazing credits, just came out yesterday. So we'll link to that as well. It's in the description uh, and I'll put it in the comments too. So please check out Richard Furch's presentation. If you haven't read it, you're not gonna regret it. And we have a nice hour long Q and A with him too. Uh, thanks again for joining us. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop, this time with Martin Spapellis of SonarWorks. See you next time. Thank you, Justin. And uh, have a great day, everybody. Thanks. All right. And we're